games. Um, okay, so uh, today I'm actually very excited because uh, I can show you a couple of things I've done during my PhD, uh, but also because maybe I can hopefully convince you that superconducting nanowires are actually a very nice technology that has a lot of potentials in several applications that have to do with microwave and photonics. And I would actually like to start when I was preparing this presentation, I was thinking, oh, well, how should I start this thing? And so maybe I want to start with an application where nanowires can actually have some impact in the next uh, ten, five to 10 years if we keep on developing them at the same uh, way we're doing it right now. So this application is actually quantum computing. And I would actually like to spend maybe a couple of minutes on it such that we can all be on the same page. So quantum computing from a textbook definition is a computational paradigm which promises to solve problems which are impossible for classical computer, particularly when we take them at scale. And it uses the laws of quantum mechanics such as superposition, entanglement, and interference on the smallest amount of quantum information, which we call the qubit, the quantum bit, uh, which is presented here as a two level systems with level zero and one. So when we talk about qubits and also quantum computing, we don't really have a unique way to make them, to, to do one. Here, for example, you can see some notable uh, technologies that I decided to show you today. I'm not gonna go into the details, but it's important to mention them. Ion traps, quantum dots, photons, color centers in diamond and silicon, and also superconducting qubits. And here I wanted to show you that actually what we might associate uh, due to the hype in the public about quantum computing, which is this thing here, uh, which is uh, maybe the most high picture of what a quantum computer looks like, which is just a dilution refrigerator. Uh, it's just a way to do quantum computation. This is what it's used to run computations from a processor made with superconducting qubit, which is hosted here, while everything else is what is needed to run the computations and to cool it down. So um, maybe a question that might come up is why do we actually care about it? So we care about quantum computing because the problems that are gonna be solvable are gonna change our society quite a lot. And we are talking about problems in encryption and cybersecurity, uh, problems that to do with the simulation of molecules. So a lot of uh, simulation of complex systems. So a lot of impact on in medicine, chemistry and other you know, application that way. And also problems that have to do with combinatorics and optimization. So um, solving logistics and manufacturing problems, and also finance, which of course, it's a very big driver uh, in this space. Um, do we have a quantum computer um, that can do all of this? So the answer is uh, no, unfortunately. So otherwise we will not be here. Uh, but we have some experiments, which we call quantum supremacy or quantum advantage, where researchers have been able to show that it's actually convenient to make a quantum computer rather than coding the same problem on a classical computer. And here I'm showing you two examples. Uh, one is from Google uh, in 2019. It's a superconducting quantum computer using superconducting qubit. And one is from John Weipan uh, groups in China performing a Gaussian boson stepping experiment with a photonic quantum computer, so using photons. So these two systems, as you can see, are very different. Uh, they run at different temperature, they use the different technologies, they look different in general. Uh, but they actually have something in common. And uh, what they have in common is that, first of all, they're actually very low power in the sense that the number of qubits is actually very low. We are talking about 53 qubits and something compatible with 100 qubits. And if we think that to solve uh, the problems that I just mentioned, we need millions of qubits, these are very early experiments, although they're very impressive. Um, at the same time, maybe what they have in common is the fact of being kind of complicated in the setup, considering how small they are on a qubit count. This one is a three meters optical table and a line. And what you don't see is all the other things that are needed to run, it, the laser and the photon detectors on the back. This one is a single dilution refrigerator, but you can see that here already, it's pretty crowded with a lot of these microwave components that are needed to run the computation. So if we were to describe what is the state of quantum computation today, we could literally use the same words that Jack Morton, who was a vice president of Bell Labs in the 60s, in the 60s was using to describe how hard it was for a classical designer to design a classical computer before the invention of integrated circuits. So uh, those systems required hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of components that all had to be connected one to the other. This is pretty much what's happening here and most probably also there. So 
Um, our target here as designers is actually to increase the number of qubits, so to increase the qubit counts. But at the same time, we don't want this to happen. So this is a picture from Cray, uh, the first supercomputer who came into the market in 1975, where to run it and to make one, you actually needed 50 miles of wiring inside. So the question is, how do we scale? And if we were to paraphrase this question, it's more, how do we keep up with the increasing number of qubits and basically avoiding making these systems even more complex to run, even more complicated in their composition? So the question, there are a few solutions here. Uh, one solution, for example, taking the superconducting computer is maybe to build the largest dilution refrigerator in the world. Uh, look here, a uh, person for scale. So this one is this one, but way bigger. Uh, it's a solution uh, in case you want to do it. Uh, but maybe another solution, always talking about superconducting computers, is to maybe design your processor. So thinking about the qubit counts in a modular way, such that we can think about scalability itself, but also taking care about the equipment. So you transform all of this cable into a cryogenic flex cables that, that make it very compact and tight. Uh, but also you can think about taking some of the electronics that is outside of the fridge, put it inside using cryosmos technology. When we talk about the photonic quantum computer instead, we have nowadays the photonic integrated circuit. And this is an example from JJ Renema's group. It's a 20 input, 20 output quantum processor. Uh, and you can see this is a three centimeter versus a three meter optical table. So the scale is, is kind of evident. So, uh, well, done in the sense that the answer to how we scale is literally integrated technologies. We need to build an integrated technology that includes both the qubits, but also everything else, the electronics, the photonics, etc. The problem though is that to build an integrated technology, particularly when we talk about quantum, uh, we have many problems. And here I actually selected two problems uh, for convenience, I would say. One is the size uh, in the sense that when we want to integrate our technology, we have to make sure that the devices that we are integrating are themselves scalable. They can be reduced in size. They're not limited by some inherent physics phenomena. Otherwise, even if we integrate them, we're going to have a large wafer for like 10 components. The second one, which is maybe more for the photonic quantum computer, is heterogeneous integrations. We have to make sure that when we integrate several platforms that use different technologies, these technologies are compatible and can be integrated. Otherwise, we will end up with some degraded performance, which are going to degrade our computer in general. So today, I hope to convince you that superconducting nanowires are the technology to solve both of these scalability bottlenecks in both the space. And this also gives me the chance to introduce the outline of this talk, what we're going to see today. First, we're going to focus on superconducting nanowire, and then we're going to use them to build ultra compact microelectronics with the idea of scaling the superconducting quantum computing technology. And then we are going to talk about detectors, high performance, and integration to scale the photonic quantum computers. And so I'd like to start with the nanowires. So nanowires, fantastic technologies, if you ask me, um, they are some, looking something like this. So we have a single nanowire, a quasi one dimensional structure fabricated on top of a substrate. And you generally make them five to 10 nanometer thick and 50 to 100 nanometer wide. And you make them with superconducting materials, for example, niobium nitride or tungsten silicide or, or other compounds of these two, niobium, niobium titanium nitride. And the critical temperature is generally about 5 to 10 Kelvin. So to run a circuit made with nanowires, you need a fridge. And that's, I mean, there is no escape from that. Um, they are superconducting structures. So the main, um, the main property is that the current flows inside them with no resistance below the critical temperature. And they are nanofabricated. And you can see here two examples that I fabricated during my PhD for uh, some projects. <laughs> one is a 35 nanometer sample, one is an 80 nanometer samples, all of them fabricated into the MIT clinic room. And speaking about nanofabrication, um, it's also important to understand how you make one in general. So you start with your substrate of interest, which could be a photonic, it could be silicon, it could be whatever you want. Um, you deposit the material, uh, the superconductor, and uh, this is already a big problem because you have to find a process that is compatible with your substrate of interest. And that's, again, heterogeneous integration matter. 
Um, you use electromimetography and etching to nanofabrication technology to pattern in a wire. And then after some cleaning step, you are left with your fantastic device ready to be used and measured. So you might be familiar with the term superconducting nanowires. In fact, there are some killer application of this technology already. Uh, in sensing, uh, nanowires make the best uh, single photon detector at near infrared wavelength. Um, and also, thanks to the work of, actually of Karl's group and many other in the, in the community, they are becoming popular as nanoelectronics elements. So by combining several nanowires, you can perform function in logic, um, analog and digital processing. Here, for example, you see a memory cell that was made in Karl's group a few years ago. Uh, the memory is actually this current circulating in the loop, and you write and read the memory using two nanowire-based devices. So that's great. Now we know what nanowires are. Um, let's see how we use them uh, to make ultra compact microwave electronics. So uh, I want to go back to this picture of this Google quantum computer uh, from 2019, quantum supremacy, very big hype, very big papers. Um, and I want you to focus on this part here. So this once again is one of the lowest stage of the dilution refrigerator. And remember 53 qubit, so relatively small computer you see how many components you need to run this type of computer. And the reason is that every qubit is kind of wired up for readout and control with multiple cables, multiple uh, devices, multiple discrete microwave devices. And these ones are directional couplers, filters, mixers, isolators, circulators, amplifiers, cables. There are many things that are very big. So of course, if we want to scale our computer, well, let's make them smaller. Let's integrate them on chip. So let's do this. Uh, but this is impossible, or at least it is possible to make it on chip, but you will get a wafer for a few components because their size being distributed is actually constrained by the wavelength of operation, which in the gigahertz frequency, which is the uh, signals that you use, is actually in the centimeter scale. So you have a few centimeter device, which is why they look that big. Also, of course, they include all the connectors, but in general, what you have inside the device is already pretty big in the centimeter scale. So I want to spend a little bit more time on this concept because this is fundamental for nanowires. And let's say that we might build our own chip technology and let's use a microstrip, which is maybe the most fundamental and easy things to do in microwave engineering when you want to make a circuit. So a microstrip is a central conductor reference to ground through a dielectric with a certain inductance and a certain capacitance. And we can describe our microwave system using very simple formula. We can calculate the effective index, which tells us how compressed is a wavelength into the circuit, and it is proportional to L times C, and the uh, impedance, which is instead proportional to L over C. And if we recast this formula a little bit, we can calculate the lambda, the wavelength of our signal, which this is a very simplified formula. It gets some assumption on which frequency you're operating at. But you can imagine that in the centimeter scale, it is proportional to one over the effective index. So now if we take standard um, microwave technology, our effective index is going to be like around two, three, four, or like in that range. And our lambda is going to be one over the effective index, about 1.5 centimeter for gigahertz frequency. And this again shows more or less the concept that I told you before, that the size is basically a centimeter scale. This is not ideal. Because again, you start integrating a few couplers, you put here and that, and you get like a eight inch wafer for like 50 qubits. And that's kind of insane. So here is where nanowire really shine. So nanowires uh, have some exotic microwave properties, which are due to the kinetic inductance, which is a serious inductance, which is due to the inertia of the superconducting carriers. And in this nanowire here, that this is actually a picture that doesn't really matter with microwave engineering. It's a nanowire on top of a wagon, but gives you the idea of how this looks like. Um, in this shape here, the kinetic inductance, the inductivity is actually one nanowire per micron, which maybe is not a lot uh, because it's nano, uh, but it's actually a, ten a, a thousand times larger than what it is in normal metal. So it's kind of high. So now look at this. We take the nanowire, Oh, sorry about that. We take the nanowire, we replace it in the central conductor of our architecture, and then our effective index maybe goes up to 100. And so our lambda goes down to micron. So you can see that by simply replacing the nanowire in our architecture, we pass from centimeter to micron. So we have two orders of magnitude to play with. Um, 
And so using nanowire, we achieve what we call the extreme wavelength compression. Um, then if you look at the formula, we include the anion inductivity. And so we also get a high impedance, which is another property of nanowire transmission lines. We get high impedance operation. And then we also get a slow speed of propagation, about 1% of the speed of light in vacuum. So these three are actually the properties of a superconducting nanowire transmission line. And we're going to use them to design ultra compact microelectronics to scale superconducting quantum computer hardware, but also any other you know, applications that might need it. So uh, the first devices that I worked on using this technology in my uh, PhD was actually trying to scale down one of these one directional coupler and make it as small as possible such that we could you know, start by designing a sort of electronics that could be integrated in the microwave regime. And here, I mostly took care about the uh, design, the fabrication, measurement was like a full stack type of work. And so uh, speaking about the directional coupler, um, this device takes some uh, power at the input port and splits it uh, with a certain ratio between the port two transmission and port four decoupling port. And this uh, ratio, this coupling ratio, depends on the design of this architecture. In this case, I'm using a parallel nanowire device with length of 520 micron and width one micron total, so including the spacing and the two nanowires. And in this case, this device is embedded in a material stack with silicon and silicon oxide. And I'm using, you can imagine this as, as a covered microstrip. So we have a microstrip with a cover. In this case, it's a silicon wafer. And then we flip it upside down. So the ground is actually on the top. This would be the standard dielectric that you use in a microstrip. And this is actually the cover. And this architecture with niobium nitride at seven nanometer gives you about an effective index of 77. So you can already see how compressed is the wavelength into the structure. So um, here you can see a stunning electron micrograph of how one of these devices looks like. This is taken before the fabrication of the oxide layer and the top down. And if we zoom in on the active device, we can see here the uh, two nanowire getting together to form the coupling section. So now this device uh, was um, simulated to work at, uh, was designed to work at five gigahertz to couple in the forward direction 50-50 at five gigahertz. And when we measure the scattering parameter as a function of the frequency, we can see that at five gigahertz, the two parameters, the S parameter for the transmission and the S parameter for the coupling actually cross, meaning that at this point, at this point 50% of the power goes to the transmission and 50% of the power goes to the coupling port. Um, another property of the kinetic inductance that I kind of didn't mention before is that it's actually a tunable property of the system. So it changes if you inject, for example, some current in one of the arm of the coupler, or you change the testing temperature. And so this gives us actually the opportunity to tune this kinetic inductance by changing this parameter and also tune the property of our device. And so here I was actually interested in seeing what happens if I measure my device at 5 gigahertz and at the same time, I start changing the injected current from zero to the maximum I can and changing the temperature from zero to the maximum I can change the temperature, so the critical temperature of the device. And you can see here that by doing that, my S parameter at 5 gigahertz uh, changes a little bit. And in this case, my transmission, my coupling parameter actually goes up, meaning that at this point, by tuning these properties, I'm able to shift some or less power to one of the two ports. In this case, more power to the coupling port. And so this makes it a tunable coupler. So to summarize this uh, device, sorry, it's... To summarize this device, this is a uh, cryogenic, it's made with nanowires, uh, directional forward coupler, and it's a tunable with parameters, so it's a tunable coupler. And it's also narrowband. Uh, right now, you saw that the, we have only one crossing point at 5 gigahertz, but this is due to the symmetric nature of the device. If we make it asymmetric, we can make it, uh, uh, we can extend the bandwidth, actually. So uh, the most, though, important property of this device is that, I guess my doesn't work anymore, so I stick here, is that the coupler footprint is 420 microns. So it's actually very small compared to one of these. The problem is that uh, you can see that I'm telling you a lie because in principle it is uh, this small, but to run it, you also need to add these four devices. And the reason is that uh, due to the kinetic inductance of, of our device, let's see if this works. Stop working, it's fine. 
due to the kinetic induct due to, to the high kinetic inductance of our device, we have to add to the uh, coupler um, other uh, four uh, uh, devices, which we call impedance matching tapers. And these are devices that are needed to match the impedance from the 50 ohm, where the word runs, to the 1.5 kilo of our nanowires, which is due basically from this formula here. We have a high inductance, so we also have a high impedance. And this is in principle okay, because you have to imagine that if we build a circuit with a lot of these nanowire devices, we won't need a lot of tapers. So they're not scaling linearly. We just need a few input and a few outputs. So our footprint is not gonna go up insanely when we increase the number of uh, devices. But still is a little bit against our initial target of designing ultra compact uh, microwave electronics. So how do we solve this problem? How do we avoid, how do, how do we avoid impedance matching? So the way to avoid impedance matching is actually to work again on this formula here. So changing the capacitance. And the way to change the capacitance is, is actually to change the substrate where you fabricate your microstrip on. And nature gives us some, uh, you know, options here, uh, silicon oxide, silicon that have the electric constant of about 4 to 12, uh, high electric constant material, actinia and titania, 25 and 80, fantastic. But if you think about that, these are never going to be able to match how high is this number here. So luckily, nature also gives us some other materials, uh, for example, strontium titanate, which is a perovskite material, and that for Kelvin, uh, it has a dielectric constant of 10,000, uh, 10, so, or even more. And so now you can see that if we think about combining these high kinetic inductance with the high dielectric constant material, maybe we can actually push down this number to 50 ohm and make everyone happy, have a uh, superconducting device that operates at 50 ohm. And so this is something that um, in collaboration with Professor Santavica at University of North Florida, we were able to demonstrate. And uh, here I'm showing you how this architecture looks like. We integrate superconducting nanowires made with niobium nitride on a high dielectric constant material, strontium titanate, fabricated with molecular beam epitaxy on silicon. And this architecture has a 50 ohm impedance and it keeps a high compression of the microwave wa wavelength of about 200 times. And so we actually proof um, and showcase this architecture, this uh, coplanar waveguide architecture, designing a stub resonator device, which is a device that resonates when the wavelength that you send in is two or four times larger than the, longer than the stub based on the design. And um, actually here is how this looks like. So this is our device, which is fabricated at MIT by me. And uh, you can see here our coplanar waveguide here with this stub departing from the coplanar waveguide. And this is just like an SCM burn, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> the nanowire is 400 nanometers and the spacing here is actually 100 nanometer. So when uh, we test this device at 1.5 Kelvin, uh, we can see that we get, um, sorry, but the slide was supposed to come out in a very, but now I don't have the thing, but it's fine. <laughs> so uh, you can see that we get resonances about, at about three and four gigahertz for stops 300 and 200 micron. And so me, maybe this again is not um, something that surprises you, but if you want to replicate the same device using maybe copper on FR4, uh, we would fabricate this. This was actually fabricated by um, Professor Santavica. And you can see how this looks and you can actually see here the scale bar, how different it is from our chip. But most importantly, if we wanted to fit our whole chip on this uh, device here, this is what would happen. This would actually fit a little bit here, actually would be a little bit bigger here, but the concept is the same. Uh, this also includes all the wire bonding parts. So you have to imagine how small is this part compared to this whole circuit. And this really showcases how much footprint reduction you have by using a superconducting on a wire device. So here I show you how you can use nanowires to design ultra compact microwave electronics. We, see, we saw a nanowire 3 b directional forward coupler with high impedance and a 77 time reduction in size compared to uh, free space. So most probably a 35 times reduction in size compared to what it would be on a uh, standard architecture and a ultra compact microwave resonator with low impedance 50 ohm and 200 times reduction in size. So this platform is, of course, cryogenic compatible because we use superconducting nanowires. You kind of need to be a cryogenic temperature, so there is no escape from that. Um, it's planar geometry. You can see it's very simple fabrication, a couple of layers. Uh, it's CMOS compatible back end of the line in the sense that you can find materials that don't destroy your CMOS integration. 
Uh, zero power consumption, uh, if you don't tune it, if you just like design your device and use it as is. And then <laughs> lossless with a, a very big caveat here, in the sense that uh, they're not gonna be really lossless uh, because you need to find, you basically need to solve some problems here. First of all, you have some uh, issue here in the design, you have to optimize your transition to minimize some losses in the circuit itself, but also find materials that are intrinsically losses, which is actually very hard. And we, I, I saw Professor O'Brien was laughing because we all know that, you know, it's, it's very hard. Uh, but they can be low loss, maybe. Um, so our target application here is, is, so, is a sort of like quantum computing adjacent in the sense that our idea was to make sure that all of these devices that are now here can be fabricated on chip and maybe co-located with our processor, uh, maybe flip chip bonding or something like that. So putting together with the idea of removing all of this stuff here. When we will increase the number of qubits to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, we can't really afford all of this here. Uh, but also this is uh, works also at, uh, you know, for other application, we don't exactly need to do quantum in general. So for example, here, some of you might have seen that this device really looks like a photonic coupler. So uh, we can think about using the photonics know-how here and maybe design a um, processor uh, using MZI meshes, so using couplers, interferometer, and phase shifters to design um, structures that can perform selective routing of signal, but also in situ computation and mapping a cryogenic temperature using microwave signals. Um, at the same time, uh, some of you might have seen that uh, because it's a 3D coupler, if you put two together, you can make an interferometer, a very compact interferometer on chip, and so you can use that as a high sensitivity subthreshold detector, or also to do some easy computation on chip and microwave frequency. And finally, uh, we are talking about transmission lines. So whatever you need to send or receive signal at cryogenic temperature, you can use one of these architectures. <coughs> here, for example, with this drawing, I just want to give you the idea that you can combine here in the readout bus and in the biasing bus, few of these devices to send and receive microwave signal, for example, from an array of detectors, which is what Adam McCon, who was uh, a student in Cas group, did in one of his recent paper with the um, IPIX account um, send, image sensor, imaging sensor. Um, okay, so um, this was concludes the first part where I show that um, you can use nanowires to make ultra compact microelectronics. Again, the idea was to maybe help the scalability of quantum computing, but also to help any other applications needed delivering uh, of microwave signal to um, a cryogenic temperature. Uh, and also now I wanna move to the second part of this talk where we're gonna talk about detectors, which is maybe the most mainstream application of, uh, SN uh, of uh, nanowires. And so uh, I want to start once again from this picture of this photonic quantum computer experiment from John Wei Pan. And once again, tell you that it's a three meter optical cable. Come on. Uh, it uses photons as qubit, and it has a large number of three space optical components. It, it, is, it is actually 50 nonlinear crystal, 50 APDs, 100 SNSPDs. It's kind of like a monster. Uh, what you don't see in this picture is that uh, you also need a pump laser that is not in this in here. And you also need these 100 SNSPDs, which are uh, on the back. This is just like the outcoupling to the SNSPDs. So you don't actually see the cabinets with the cryostats and all of the SNSPDs. And I said that, um, well, we would like to uh, move to integrated technology. And so we have uh, nowadays, of course, photonic integrated circuits to take all of these and put it on chip. But you can see here, for example, that in this uh, device from Renema's group, you still have an uh, input and an output because you still have source and detectors outside. So the reason here is that it's very hard to integrate heterogeneous platforms. You need like nonlinearities that you need to put in your linear photonics, and you also need superconductors that you need to put on your linear photonics. So it's kind of a hard problem to integrate both of these technology. So assuming that uh, maybe we don't want to integrate for now, let's put it that way. Um, can we improve the detectors to maybe pass from 100 detectors to 50 detectors or to 25? Can we do something about the performance of our detectors such that we can reduce the numbers and maybe perform more, uh, you know, experiments uh, with higher performance? So I want to talk about uh, the detectors that this experiment was using, the SNSPD, the superconducting nanowire single photon detector. 
You can see one here. Uh, it's made of a single nanowire meandered in this compact form, such that I can free space couple my uh, light with a fiber or with like some free space optics with lenses. And uh, it's superconducting nanowire, so it has to be tested at one Kelvin in specific cryosats. So um, how, does, how does one work? So you take your uh, current bias superconducting nanowire, we said it, it's a superconducting element, so current flows with no resistance. A photon will arrive on the nanowire, break the superconductivity, and lead to the degeneration of something that we call the hotspot, which is a hot region that we push out, uh, hot and normal region, then we push out the bias current and pushing it to the uh, readout, leading to the creation of a rising edge. And then this rising edge will reset with a certain time constant, which is due to the thermos, the electrical circuit, and the detector itself. So this is the best technology for near infrared photons. And when you say something like that, you kind of need to uh, prove it, otherwise, you know, it doesn't work out. And here I'm actually showing you uh, an updated chart with uh, the most updated things I could find in the literature, where we compare the SNSPD, the nanowire detector, with other technology in the same space, the single photon avalanche photodiode, the transition edge sensor, and the silicon photon multiplier. And you can see that for these selected metrics, the SNSPD can win in any sort of metrics. And the metrics we are talking about are the system detection efficiency, how efficient is a detector, uh, from 0 to 100%. <laughs> the record is 98% from NIST. Uh, the jitter, which is the timing uncertainty of this detector. And uh, once again, uh, the record here is 4.5 picosecond. It actually belongs to us. And I was personally involved in making this uh, record uh, experiment by fabricating the detector. Uh, we want to push that number to zero, uh, which of course is not possible, but you know we are approaching zero, kind of. It's picosecond already. Um, dark count rate, how many spurious counts you have in your detectors, either due most probably to intrinsic phenomena, and we have 10 to the minus seven counts per second. It's another uh, record that we hold here at MIT, and I was also involved in making the detector here. And then the count rate, how many counts you can expect on your detector, 1.5 giga count per second, a very new uh, record from JPL of this year. So this is all fantastic because SNSPDs are the best, but you have to remember that these are academic demonstrations. So no way that these uh, metrics both exist in the same detector. So you can't really buy a detector that has 98% efficiency and 4.5 picosecond jitter. What you can buy maybe uh, it's a detector from um, photon spot, for example, a very known company among us, uh, where you maybe buy a detector with an 85% uh, system detection efficiency and a 40 picosecond jitter, and you also pay $25,000 for this. Um, so this is fine for most of the applications that we have nowadays, but for the new applications coming in when we need very high performance in many metrics, this is kind of like it, it's becoming a little short, like we need to improve this technology somehow. And so in my PhD, I really spent, I would say, several years uh, trying to solve this problem. Um, and here I want to tell you why there is a trade-off in the performance metric. And in particular, I'm going to talk about these two performance metrics, the system detection efficiency and the timing jitter, which is what really we want to maximize both in the application. So once again, sorry for these animations. Um, OK, so let's see why there is a trade-off in these two performance metrics. So let's take an example here, our SNSPD embedded in our optical cavity, our optical stack, to make sure that we improve the absorption and we may get some high efficiency. So let's also get a 20 micron by 20 micron detector, which is on the average size. And we do that such that we are able to collect all the spot of the fiber that we project on top here. And uh, by using a 20 by 20 detector, our nanowire will be about one millimeter long from end to end. So now um, our all active area can detect. So I have photon counts from here, photon counts from here, and from here. So the photon counts from here will actually generate some rising edge that we'll have to travel from here all the way till the end. Um, while my counts from here will only have to travel three, four, five wires and exit here. So what we experience is a certain delay in the output statistics, statistics of our count, uh, which you can see here, and we call jitter in general. That's how I'm saying it. But because uh, this is mostly due to the geometry of the detector, so how large is our detector, how long is our detector, we call this the geometric contribution to the time in jitter. And look at this. Due to these exotic, fantastic microwave properties before, 
Uh, we have this low speed of propagation in the wire, which is about three microns per picosecond, 1% of the speed of light in vacuum. And now you can make the math how long it takes to run one millimeter at this speed. Um, from here to here, you have about 300 picosecond travel time. And that's kind of bad because it means that if you make a detector that large to maximize the efficiency, you also have a very bad jitter because you don't see where the detection happened. You just see these at the output. So it's just a delay that you experience. And so that's why you always navigate in this trade-off between efficiency and also area. Of course, like uh, if you make a small detector, you have a small efficiency. If you make a large detector, you want to have a large, uh, large efficiency. Anyway, the trade-off is between efficiency and area and time in resolution. Our 98 record detector actually had a 150 picosecond jitter, while our jitter record 4.5 picosecond had a 0.01% efficiency. And you can see here how we navigate in this fantastic curve while we would like to be here. Um, so this is unacceptable. So here I'm introducing for you the impedance match differential architecture, which is something that I really worked on during my PhD quite a lot, and it took some time to get it done and published. Um, here I'm taking my SNSPD here, and I'm doing two modifications to the architecture. First, I use the impedance matching taper, which I talked about before, and this is done to match the impedance of the nanowire. And secondly, I use differential readout, which is uh, an important technology that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But the way it works is you have a detection event. The detection event generates two counts, one, sorry, two um, pulses, one with a rising edge, one with a falling edge. You collect both at each end of the detector. And here, the differential readout is what really makes the difference. So I'd like to spend a minute on this technology. This was actually introduced for SNSPD by one of CARB's students in 2016. And I put it here together with the both impedance matching taper and the differential readout. So um, let's assume that uh, our SNSPD is now linearized in a single nanowire from zero to L, and a photon comes down and generates a hotspot at position XP and then polar coordinate TP. So now this hotspot will generate two rising, one rising edge, one falling edge. These two edges will travel to the output, and here they can be time tagged. You can use an oscilloscope, you can use a time tagger, whatever you want. We can also write these time tags as a function of the temporal coordinate and the spatial coordinate by analytically analyzing this situation. And then you can also see that if we take and uh, we do some math on the, on the time tags, we can, by taking the difference, get rid of the temporal coordinate and only focus on XP. If we take the sum, we can actually get rid of the spatial coordinate and only focus on the temporal coordinate when the photon came down. So here you can see that if you associate this T sigma, T sum, to your detection event, you basically got rid of the spatial information on the detector. And so you made your, det your detection event independent from the geometry. And so using T sigma, T sigma makes our detection event independent from the geometry. Your device might be a kilometer long. It will look like a single dot firing. So this is how one of these devices looks like. And you can see one here. Actually, I have one here for you if you want to have a look at that later. Um, it's a, uh, you can recognize your SNSPD active area here. You can recognize an optical cavity that we designed to increase the efficiency. You can recognize the differential readout and the impedance matching taper that run along the die. This die is a lollipop, you can see that. And the reason why it's designed in this way, it's because we take a fiber sleeve, we put it on here, and then we take our fiber and we put the fiber on here as well, such that the fiber core will project a spot aligned exactly on the SNSPD active area. And this will serve as a self-aligned detector. And the only the basic the precision is basically due to the deep reactive ion etching that you do to release this die. And this fabrication was done in combo at JPL and MIT. I fabricated the detector part, and JPL mostly took care of making the lollipop because they own and they, they are very used in making this type of architecture. So here I actually flew down to JPL, actually flew, I would say, left to JPL. Uh, it's, uh, to test this device. And so here I'm showing you the first metric that we care about, the system detection efficiency, which is measured as a function of the bias current you provide. And so here I'm actually um, testing four detectors, which are ordered by size from D to A, from the smallest to the bigger, single wire, large area device. And you can see that um, 
for the single wire, we get an 8% efficiency, which actually is already a fantastic result considering that it's just like a horizontal wire in the optical cavity. But then as we increase the size, we also increase the efficiency. And this is expected because larger detector, larger efficiency, all fine. Um, we are unfortunately limited at 85%, which I kind of said that it was a bad result. And uh, um, unfortunately, the reason is that the optical cavity was not fantastically uh, matched to the wavelength that we were using. So we don't really get the same 95%, but by improving the designs, we can definitely break the 90% record. Sorry, the 90% um, threshold for the efficiency. Um, then we also test the um, timing jitter. Uh, which is the important metric here, because remember that once again, we want to merge high efficiency and low jitter on the same device. So here I'm testing the jitter as a function of the bias current, and I'm testing these devices for 15, 50 nanometer telecom band and 775 nanometer. You can see that all our devices, no matter what the size are, breaks, first of all, the 15 picosecond barrier, which is kind of like a, you know, emotional barrier of what you should get as a result. <laughs> um, but you can see that the spread due to size is only one picosecond. It's, more, it's not more 100 picosecond as we had before. And for 70, 75 nanometer, another like emotional barrier or whatever you want to call this about. And we have a 2.5 picosecond spread for 70, 75 nanometer, no matter the size. So, uh, you have to imagine that this detector here, this 8.3 picosecond, is a 8% detector efficiency with 8 picosecond jitter. And this is kind of a big deal in the performance metric that you can achieve around with these detectors. And it's actually a record in the field. Um, then, uh, thanks to the presence of the refresher readout, we also have some bonuses uh, in the performance of this detector. For, for example, the imaging capabilities. And I'm gonna explain that with a very simple example. So let's say that this dark, um, square here is our active area that we did our coupling, but we made a mistake. And our coupling is slightly misaligned off the center of delta y delta x. So now if we analyze the uh, distribution um, at the output, uh, our counts, and we actually calculate our t delta, which you remember was the difference of the time tags and was proportional to xp only. And if we analyzing the output histogram of our count, we are able to reconstruct how much was our delta x and delta y. In this case, for example, uh, if we analyze the envelope of this histogram here for device A, we can see that the center of the histogram is not at zero. And we can reconstruct this Ty as a function of a delta Y sheet on the active area. And actually for your information, device A had a three micron vertical shift on the bottom direction. And so we can use this technology, this technique to actually image the mode on the active area as a diagnostic tool to understand if we are misaligned or not but also at the same time, maybe to image the mode. I don't know, maybe it's useful. Uh, another property, another bonus property of this device is that it has photon number resolution, which is a very big deal for quantum applications. So in this case, our amplitude of the pulse encodes how many photons you have in a single optical packet. Um, you can see here, for example, that we are illuminating our detector with 0.73 effective photon number. So we expect a lot of n equal to one detection events, some n equal to two photon counts and a very few n equal or bigger than three. And we are able to do this discrimination on how many photons you have on your detector because before doing that, we calibrate this type of process by reconstructing the uh, Poisson statistics of a coherent source. And this is again, something that was never demonstrated before on a differential high performance device. So it's another record for this type of detector. Um, something else uh, that you can have if you want, is not exactly in this architecture here, but it's something that I worked on during my PhD, is the detection of 7.4 micron in the sense that you can uh, increase and improve and uh, change the uh, fabrication technology and the material to push to high sense, high, um, sorry, mid-air photons. In this case, we are able to detect 7.4 micron photon in this large area device and by simply uh, changing the fabrication process and the material. Currently, this capability is not here, but it can be just placed there by changing the material and fabricating narrower than a wire. In this case, 60 nanometer. So to summarize, this is an all-rounder design that can be useful for several applications. And here, I wanna show you very quickly um, well, this is the summary of our performances. So we get record jitter in large area format, state of the art efficiency, photon number resolution, imaging capability, and also mid-air detection if you want.
And as I was saying, I want to show you some applications where having a detector like this could be useful. These are applications that I worked on during my PhD with using other type of detectors, but where having this type of detector would have been very useful. Uh, biomedical application, it's becoming very important to have a detector that can be really fast, high efficiency to detect fluorophores that are engineered to be uh, bright and also uh, to decrease the autofluorescence, so basically to increase the contrast of the image. These fluorophores decay really fast, about 40 picoseconds, so you need a detector to be able to image them and characterize them. Um, Detectors, as an SPD, are, are being very important in the use for high energy physics applications, where we want a very low noise detector, high efficiency, to capture all the counts coming from very rare high energy physics experiments. Um, single photon LIDAR. This picture was actually taken with this detector here. It's a gloved hand at 325 meters away, and it's reconstructed with just 5 to 15 photons in most of the counts. So it's kind of an impressive demonstration on how your um, your logiter can really do well for you if you use them. And finally, again, if you extend your sensitivity to mid IR, you can actually use this detector for environmental sensing and also space application. Uh, we started all of this with quantum technologies, so I also want to go why this is important for quantum applications. And I said, okay, well, here in this experiment there are 100 detectors. So can we use 50 detectors instead of 100? Yes, you can use a photon number resolution capabilities to start performing um, experiments where you would actually need more than one detector. For example, this Hongo Mandel experiment that we did with a uh, previous version of this detector that was not differential, but had PNR capabilities. Here we demonstrate uh, Hongo Mandel experiments. We use one PNR detector instead of two threshold detectors. So we just need half of the detector if we do this type of characterization. And here it's another experiment that used the detector that I just showed you. We use a PNR detector to decrease the second order autocorrelation function out of an heralded single photon source because we are able to discriminate if we have multi thread generation of, of an SPDC process. So um, that's all fantastic. But remember, 100 detectors, free space coupled. That's impressive. Um, and we said that we have the technology to make all of these on chip. Um, Source and detector. I can't do anything for the source because I'm mm -hmm. not a source person. Most probably Dirk student can tell you way more about that than me, uh, but I can tell you about detectors for sure. So our target here is to pass from a free space, free space couple technology to an integrated technology. And here, um, with, we, with the advent of photonic integrated circuit, also SNSPDs pass from a free space couple technology to a waveguide integrated technology. Our Meander detector is, is replaced here with a single nanowire, which is coupled directly on top of the waveguide. It takes the light in here, it absorbs evanescently. And of course, this has several advantages of using a free space coupled detector. You don't need a uh, free space coupling, and your detector is, it, it is way smaller. It's a simple nanowire here. Um, this is not free, in the sense that it doesn't come for free, it's not very easy to do. In fact, here we enter in the heterogeneous integration problem that I was talking about before. Uh, we have two problems. Both is a superconducting uh, material compatibility issues because when we deposit our superconductor on top of our substrate, for example, our photonic platforms, we have to make sure that our detectors still work. So we might have issues in the gravy superconductivity. Flip side, when you fabricate a detector on the photonics, you might damage the photonics, so you might get high losses. So you have to really calibrate your process to make sure that you get high yield detectors and also you don't screw up your photonics. So here I'm showing you uh, one of my last devices I worked on. Uh, I'm demonstrating a SNSPDs on lithium nitrate. And here I want to focus the lithium nitrate part because these detectors have been demonstrated on several platforms, silicon, silicon nitrate, aluminum nitrate. But for lithium niobate and new platforms that have a very harsh etching process, it becomes really hard to integrate the detector. And here you can see our SNSPD on top of the optical waveguide. The waveguide was fabricated at Harvard University while I did all the other things, the detector and the testing. And here we have sort of a recipe of how to make one on lithium niobate. First, you have to use a waveguide first approach. You want to make sure that you separate the fabrication of lithium niobate, which is very harsh, from the detector fabrication. You first make, make the waveguide. Then you have to use a buffer layer, in this case, 10 nanometer of neum oxide between the photonics and the superconductor, because when you etch the, the detector, you want to make sure you don't destroy the photonics. 
And then in this case, I use an amorphous superconductor, molysilicon, molysilicide with amorphous silicon. And I use that such to make sure that my in general amorphous superconductors have less requirements on which subset you can integrate on. So this works really well by exchanging our you know, a subset a little more. So um, this, is the, this is how the detector looks like. And after testing that with cryogenic alignment, uh, I'm able to show you how much, how efficient it is. So I get a 50% on-chip detection efficiency for this type of detector. So maybe this is not a number that is a lot, but it's actually the record for this type of detector in only two nanobits. So it's actually a very surprising and important result. We get 50% efficiency on this platform with direct integration. And also um, before, instead of, so I told you that there is a recipe to make this detector. If you don't use that recipe, you only get here. So this type of like fabrication expertise that builds on using buffer layers and uh, amorphous superconductors can really push up the efficiency, while before we were only able to get 5% or below. Uh, we also tested the jitter, uh, which unfortunately it's a little bit underwhelming. It's 82 picoseconds, which is garbage for like, for like high, high important applications. But you have to consider that our nanowire here, it's about one millimeter, once again. So we expect that most of this timing jitter here is due to some geometric components of the timing jitter. So we expect that by testing this detector with a differential readout and improving a little bit the setup, we might be able to push this down to, let's say, sub-20 picoseconds. Um, so a summary of this part, we got integrated SMSPDs, record performance on lithium nanobit. Okay, so um, we are at the end of this uh, collection of works. And I hope to have shown you that nanowires are good multifaceted technological platforms and you can use them to make a lot of things. You can design cryogenic microelectronics and achieve 200 times put free reduction, high impedance and low impedance. Uh, you can really think and try to understand why your detector doesn't achieve what you want. And you can get high performance single photon detectors with record jitter in large area format photon number resolution, which is very important for quantum applications, and mid-IR photon detections if you want to have that. And then we also show that by working a little bit on the fabrication process, you can get, you can get record efficiency of single element on lithium nanobit, which is very promising for quantum application. And speaking of applications in the quantum area, uh, here we were thinking about using nanowires to try to solve the scalability, the hardware scalability problem of superconducting quantum computing, which is due to this part here. If we increase the qubit count, we can't really tolerate the same way of doing it. And also to start thinking about taking all of this stuff and putting it on chip and combining it with on-chip detectors and also on-chip source, but it's not my case. Um, so what's the future of this technology? And that's really important because I really believe in nanowire. So I kind of wanted to give you an idea of what I think we should do to push this technology uh, to new limits. Okay, so. The next thing to do is actually to build a monolithic integrated nanowire technology, which basically means that on the same chip, we can have detection. Once again, sorry. Yeah, we can have detection here, integrated as an SPD, but also some interface device to collect signals from other type of devices. And then on the same chip, also have the processing elements, which is composed of the nanoelectronic devices that I showed you before, the memory, the logic functions, the digital electronics, the analog electronics, as well as microwave devices for processing, routing, and signal conditioning. And to do that, we have to invest on three different things. First, heterogeneous integration, in the sense that we really need to study how to put these things on the other platforms. And also start convincing that it's time to go to foundry processing and push nanowires to this foundry level. At the same time, we need to do some investment for materials in the sense that we can't operate forever at one Kelvin. We need to think about adding high performance devices, maybe closer to the uh, liquid nitrogen temperature because in the long run, we can't afford to have one Kelvin cryostat. We need to go to uh, 40, 50, and also the price is gonna go down very significantly if we do that. And also of course device design, but it's kind of trivial. We have, we have to build more integrated circuit, more integrated design. And um, so this was the conclusion of my talk. I would, write, I would really like to thank Carl for allowing me to be in your group and also to give me the possibility to work on this stuff that I really love 
and I and I mean maybe some of you know, but I will try to keep on working on it in the next future. And also the current and old member of the QN groups. Uh, I would like to thank all my collaborators, Professor Daniel Santamica, Professor Dirk Englund, thank you so much for the opportunity to collaborate. Professor Kevin O'Brien, thank you so much for the advices over the year. And also all the other people at JPL, Caltech, NIST, Lancaster University, Harvard University, Long Heart Group. Uh, Arizona State University, Polytechnic di Torino was like a comeback to Italy. And also all the funding that supported me over this year, internal funding, uh, the Jacos Presidential Fellowship, the Clovisian Award, the NSF funding, and the DARPA funding that supported um, this work. Um, I also would like to thank some people that some of them are here, uh, which made <laughs> this experience a little bit more be better and you know, fun. Uh, maybe you didn't want me to show these pictures, but <laughs> that's for you. Murat, I can see you there, even in Hawaii. That's good. Um, I also like to thank my family. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation today and also to, you know, giving me the possibility to, uh, at the end, arrive here. Um, you know, it's mostly on you as well. And also I'd like to thank my wife, Sarah. Thank you so much uh, for everything you do for me, for supporting me every day, and uh, also for coming here in Boston after many years uh, uh, apart. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, if you have questions, please invest in questions. Thank you.